You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you are tuned in to Questions for Corbett, specifically the 31st episode of this series for July of 2016. And as always, I'm going to answer as many questions as I can, and there's a zillion and a half of them, so I won't even get to a tiny percentage of them. Once again, my apologies if I don't get to your question in particular. Um, as always, there are many, many different ways to get your questions in. Of course, you can submit them via Twitter using the QFC hashtag. You can submit a video uh, question on YouTube or Vimeo or any other platform. Just send me the link. You can email me through the contact form and or you can leave a SpeakPipe uh, audio message for me. And of course, the best way to do it, leave a question in the comment thread for this QFC edition on CorbettReport.com. Speaking of which, just browsing through the QFC number 30 comment section, I'll note that there were a lot of responses to the questions for you from last edition of this series. Of course, there was the uh, the question about how anarchists should or should not participate in a Brexit-type referendum, and there was the question of where to go to maximize freedom or how to measure freedom. Lots of interesting and thought-provoking responses from the engaged corporate report community, so thank you to all of you for that participation, and especially thank you to the very first question and answer in that comment thread, which is beautiful. It's an example that uh, I love to see where there's a question and one of the Corbett Report users uh, provided an answer. I like to see that kind of back and forth. So we have Ismado95 writing, Hi James, did the American government save the Great Plains from the Dust Bowl? This is the narrative we learned in American high schools, and I'm a bit skeptical of it because it supports the idea that the government is able and responsible for fixing environmental catastrophes. So did better farming techniques from the government and planting of trees cure the Dust Bowl, or is there something more to it? Thanks. And uh, JHN Small 6 provided an answer uh, No, after 40 years of attempting to reverse or correct the damage done, the agency created reported that they only had a 60% success. Uh, Congress taught the bureaucracy, uh, the bureaucracy that failure is the way to succeed. Congress increased their budget fourfold. And then he goes on to talk about um, farming techniques that had been encouraged by government programs uh, of in the early days of uh, settling America where the government would continue to give people cheap uh, arable land so they would basically farm the uh, the ever-loving something or other out of the uh, land and uh, just maximize short-term profit, destroy the land, and move on to the next government-provided land. Obviously not a sustainable way of doing it. And uh, talking about that, that history and context, which of course helped um, create some of the conditions that led to that Dust Bowl. But uh, I'll go even one step further. Um, I will also throw in a link to an article that uh, discusses this at some degree of length about uh, an American thinker, specifically about the soil erosion service that was created by FDR as part of his New Deal. Um, back in 1933, it was rolled into the Department of Agriculture in 1935, and their bright idea, those technocrats at the Soil Erosion Service, decided, hey, we've got a, an answer to the Dust Bowl. Why don't you plant kudzu, which had been introduced in, the, I believe, the late 19th century um, to uh, Philadelphia from, of course, the East here in Japan. Um, as just a, a sort of, uh, you know, an interesting novelty. And it was, there was some small-scale private uh, planting of it in gardens and things. But the government came along and decided, hey, the vines will help um, keep the soil in place. Let's start encouraging farmers to plant it. So they, they paid $8 an acre for farmers to plant it. And what was the result of this uh, social pl- central planning technocratic en- uh, uh, agricultural engineering project? The vines made themselves at home, growing up to a foot per day during the warmer months. Over two dozen stems can emerge from a single crown, and each of those can stretch over a hundred feet. A single massive taproot can weigh up to 400 pounds. Its underground rhizomes ignore the cold and survive for years before sprouting. It strangles trees, smothers meadows, undermines buildings, and pulls down power lines. The vine now covers 7 million acres in the U.S., and the damage it has caused is in the hundreds of millions. If you live in the South, you may not want to sleep with the windows open. 
Oh, that's right, complete and total disaster, brought to you by the US government and their technocratic meddlers. Yes, just to put that in perspective with some numbers, there is now uh, 10,000 square miles of kudzu overgrowing, uh, mostly in the south of the United States, but it's spread to other areas as well. And 150,000 new acres grow every single year, a complete and total disaster brought to you by meddling technocratic central planners. Yay. Um, as always, as always, when there is, I mean, this is just a perfect example of that, but it's always the phenomenon when technocrats and central planners get in and start trying to create, uh, you know, ideas to, to skew the, skew the, the, skew nature, skew the markets, skew whatever, then it will get skewed and it will usually over correct in that direction in uh, horrific ways. And this is a perfect example of that. So no, the government didn't solve the Dust Bowl and make everything magically better. In fact, they've just created an incredibly new uh, problem that wasn't there before. So keep that in mind um, next time you ask the government to come save you from some disaster. All right, um, next, Bub Romer asks, uh, I have a mundane presentational question for James. What is the story behind the title of the show, New World Next Week? And I note that, like the previous question, this question was also answered by a subsequent Corbett Report user, but I know James Evan Pilato always loves to answer these questions, so James, take it away. Hey, thanks for the question, Bub Romer. I, I do actually love telling this story because for me, a lot of the work always comes back to having a nice concept I can sort of hang my hat on. And once I have that, I can sort of do the work over and over again. Council on Foreign Relations has a podcast that they actually still do called The World Next Week. And as we were diving more and more into doing alternative media and looking at who was really kind of the organizations and things behind the scenes, we all realized that Council on Foreign Relations was a biggie. And they had a podcast. So in thinking of a name for our show, I don't know, it must have just been the light bulb over my head and I was following a lot of podcasts at that point. And I'm always trying to think of band names and interesting project names of court food world order and cyberspace war and all the funny names that i have for media monarchy new world next week is just a play on the title of the council on foreign relations podcast the world next week and even the album art which we'll still have associated with some of the podcasts and some of the audio versions of new world next week is a mock-up i did on my own that again is a parody of the council on foreign relations podcast album art where we just kind of adjusted some of the things and and again, it's a parody. It's a satire. I know by this point, almost seven years on, they have to be aware of us, but I've never had anything sort of sent to me. Council on Foreign Relations has yet to block me on Twitter, which sometimes I'm actually surprised about as much as I, I tag them and comment about their, their, their workings. But that is pretty much the simple answer. And yes, it also it rolls off the tongue really well. And for like a lot of things, once you kind of hear that, and for me, whether it was Media Monarchy or New World Next Week, ah, it has that sound. And it has that sound that I knew resonated with me. So I, and I figured hopefully it would resonate with other people as well. And so far, so good. It has. So thanks again for the question, Bub Romer. All right. Thank you, James, for helping out with that. Or, um, moving right along, uh, AB33 wrote in an email to ask... I'm curious as to whether the US DOD and the intelligence apparatus have separate black, black budgets. There are a whole gang of numbers floating around. 50 billion, 53 billion, 60 billion. Intentionally obfuscated, no doubt. All right, uh, well, I'll put a specific number on it uh, via Ed Snowden. So it must be true, right? Um, yes, back in 2013, Snowden reported that the, well, from documents that came supposedly from Snowden, uh, it was reported that uh, when you add it all up, it's $52.6 billion, the black budget for the U.S. intelligence community generally. Um, and the actual document that this comes from is this 170-page document that the Washington Post printed a very... Uh, I think they redacted it to the point where it's only 10% of the, uh, the original document, but they provided some charts that they, they constructed from the information. So trust them, guys. $52.6 billion. All right. Uh, let's say that that's true, that the black budget is $52.6 billion. I think we have to understand that the black budget is still, it is a budget that is still overseen by 
parts of Congress, the parts that have the clearance to, to look at these numbers, and it's still part of those appropriations. It's, a, a, uh, it's still part of the overall budget. It's just a budget that the public can't see because the mere peons, of course, can't peer in under the hood of the national security state, right? But that's not all the funds that these groups have to play with, and that's been proven time and time and time and time and time and time again throughout history. I mean, what was Iran-Contra? Congress says you can't trade with Iran. Uh, Congress says you can't fund the Contras, so they trade with Iran via Israel in order to fund the Contras. And it's all money that Congress didn't give them. It's all money that they're creating themselves and then using illegally. There's no oversight. There's no Congress, uh, you, you know, people overlooking this. Uh, this isn't coming from the government. It's all illegal funds that they're just playing with. And uh, that's, pr I mean, that's that's much more common than I think most people would understand or believe. Um, you have uh, f front companies. I did an eye-opener report on this that I'll put in the show notes. Um, who really knows how much of the economy is front companies for various intelligence agencies? But we know entire airlines have been uh, front companies for intelligence agencies, all sorts of other businesses. Banks have been you know, if not entire fronts for intelligence agencies, at least certainly used um, and appropriated for intelligence purposes. The banks for the bank for Crooks and Criminals International (BCCI) and uh, the Nugent Hand Bank, and all, uh, examples like that that we can at least put our finger on and document. And then you look at something like uh, Incutel, which is the CIA's venture capital firm. Again, I'll put the link in the show notes for, uh, to my eye opener report on that where you, had, uh, you, you have the CIA with a venture capital investment firm that uh, seeds money to various projects that it finds interesting for its own purposes. And, you know, what, what are the companies that are invested in by the CIA? I mean, to what extent can you... It, it's always cutouts and middlemen and uh, the plausible denial. So you'll never have a paper trail connecting the CIA to Pokemon Go, but you do have a paper trail connecting the CIA's venture capital firm to Keyhole Inc., which became Google Maps, and the co-founder of Keyhole Inc. Uh, started up Niantic Labs within Google, which was then spun off and created Pokemon Go. Hey, it's an, I mean, so to what extent could you ever prove some sort of paper trail or some, you know, the CIA, you know, created or owns Pokemon Go, but what kind of connections are there? What kind of influence, control? To what extent can the CIA influence or, or directly benefit from the profits that are spun off from these com uh, companies? Um, again, uh, some of this is out in the open and some of it is under the table and it, none of this is included per se in the budget. Um, so I think we have to separate the black budget from the illegal slush funds. And who knows? I mean, the CIA ships and the drugs, uh, they get the money from all sorts of shadiness like that that is not calculated and I don't think here's the thing I don't think anyone on the planet no one I doubt truly knows the number because there are compartments compartmentalization there are different operations going on that you know the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing people within the agency generally don't know what the, the person next to them metaphorically or literally is doing what they're working on because they don't have clearance for it so there's all these different compartments in, within these intelligence agencies that can hide their their budgets in different ways so i don't think anyone has the number um, but I can guarantee you it's more than that $52.6 billion that Snowden um, supposedly leaked. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, we have this question in from Laszlo. Uh, he writes, what is your view on the destruction or at least the dilution of the traditional Western culture through the forceful introduction of Islamic refugees? And what consequences do you foresee? Are we doomed to have a major class, clash of cultures between the traditional Christian Western culture on one side and the Islamic culture on the other side? Hmm. Good question. Clash of cultures. No, that doesn't sound quite right. Clash of, clash of civilizations. That's right. Where did I hear that? Um, 23 years ago. Oh, that's right, our good friends at the Council on Foreign Relations. Foreign Affairs, Summer 1993 The Clash of Civilizations by Samuel P. Huntington The Next Pattern of Conflict 
World politics is entering a new phase, and intellectuals have not hesitated to proliferate visions of what it will be. The end of history. The return of traditional rivalries between nation-states. And the decline of the nation-state from the conflicting pulls of tribalism and globalism, among others. Each of these visions catches aspects of the emerging reality. Yet they all miss a crucial, indeed a central aspect, of what global politics is likely to be in the coming years. It is my hypothesis that the fundamental source of conflict in this new world will not be primarily ideological or primarily economic. The great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Nation-states will remain the most powerful actors in world affairs, but the principal conflicts of global politics will occur between nations and groups of different civilizations. The clash of civilizations will dominate global politics. The fault lines between civilizations will be the battle lines of the future. Conflict between civilizations will be the latest phase in the evolution of conflict in the modern world. That's right. Foreign Affairs, the journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, published Samuel P. Huntington's landmark essay in 1993, 23 years ago, The Clash of Civilizations, developed into a book in 1996, which became one of the key key filters, key ways that foreign policy planners have been looking at the world in the post-Cold War era, well, for the last couple of decades. Um, and yes, once again, the Council on Foreign Relations, and just to put it in perspective, who's Samuel P. Huntington? Not only was he an insider in the National Security Council and the Carter administration, but he um, made his name back in the 1960s, I think 68, writing again in foreign affairs for the CFR. Um, with a wonderful strategy for uh, isolating the Viet Cong in South Vietnam by getting the South Vietnamese rural um, population into the cities. And how do you drive them into the cities? Carpet bombing and defoliating the, uh, the countryside. Oh, napalm. I love the smell of napalm in the morning, wrote Samuel P. Huntington in the 60s. And he became, well, that set him on his path to academic superstardom. And the culmination of it was the clash of civilizations. Yes, well, how amazingly predictive that narrative has become? Or is it one of those self-fulfilling prophecies? My money is on the latter. We have to understand what is happening now with the craziness, with all these terror attacks and everything. We have to understand this as part of an engineered conflict. This conflict has been engineered Really, you can look for at least a century of history, and you can look at the creation of radicalized Islamic groups, the fostering, the funding, the protection, the arming, the training of these groups. Not just the famous example, that I th or the infamous example, that I'm sure we all know by now that Osama bin Laden was the CIA's golden boy back in Afghanistan in the 80s when he was fighting those damn Ruskies. It's not just that. The history is much wider, broader, deeper than that. Go look at the origins of the Muslim Brotherhood. Go look at um, the creation of Hezbollah. Go look at the creation, of course, of Al-Qaeda, ICISIS. Again, time and time and time again, the most radicalized elements are being supported, fostered, funded, taken care of. And we see a microcosm of that in the 28 pages, which, you know, obviously has its own reservations. But still, that's the idea that the U.S. government, highly in bed with these people who are funding radical terrorism, again, the terrorists are really the ones in government. So, again, we have to understand that. And again, it's not even just the funding of the radical Muslim groups. It's also the destruction of any alternative. Um, look at Nasser, Nasserism, um, and how that was uh, pan-Arabism, how that was ultimately undermined and destroyed and eradicated because that is the real threat um, uh, to the globalists who, of course, want the radical Islamic side of this that they can plop into that equation to make a clash of civilizations. Why make a clash of civilizations? It's a further rung up the ladder of centralization. It's not just, uh, you know, principalities. It's not just nation states. Now it's 
entire civilizations are warring with each other. The, uh, the collective grows larger and larger with each iteration of this dialectic until eventually you've got the big clash of, you know, whatever two major powers, however that's divided up, into whatever kind of regional blocks. And either you have some sort of 1984-ish, you know, war with East Asia, we were never at war with East Asia, in which it's all just, you know, showing games to basically not placate the public, but keep the public in fear, or ultimately the uh, the unveiling of the one world government to save us from this, you know, this horrible um, uh, clash that's taking place. Either way, that is the end goal of this clash of civilizations. So here's the news flash: all of this, these these terror events and everything, have to be seen as engineered products of that clash of civilization that has been engineered into place for. A century or more and until and unless we truly internalize that then there is no way to win the rigged game uh, if you take sides in a rigged game you're gonna lose either way you're, or the game is going to play out exactly the way the person who rigged it wants it to play out and uh, that's of course we know where the globalists want to take this so the way not to play this game is not to give into the collectivism the collectivization the the subsuming of your identity in some sort of civilization like because you were born here or because you are this this person that you now subsume the entire you, you know you uh, uh, reflect the identity of an entire civilization and that is reflected in you um, the, that collective mindset is the basis of the clash of civilizations, and that's the reason they want to get you further ensconced in their system. Um, the way to get out of that, again, bring it down to individuals, individualism, getting away from collectivism. And of course, people are going to come back when you start talking about that with the straw man about, oh, individual isolation, you know, everyone's an island. That's, that doesn't work with modern society. That isn't what individualism means. It means that you do not, there is no utilitarian ethic that says the greater good. There is no subsuming of your identity, who you are as a human being. You specifically are not a civilization. You're not tied into a billion people because of where you were born or anything of that sort. And the quicker we free ourselves from those mental traps, the quicker we get out of the Clash of Civilizations game that they are setting up. It is a rigged game. You lose if you play. I'm going to include some... I mean, there's so much history that has to be understood to understand this, so I'm just going to include a few links to a few of the things that I've done over the years. Uh, the last word on terrorism, talking about the destruction of Pan-Arabism and Nasser in particular. Uh, I did a Corporate Report radio episode on the Muslim Brotherhood and where they come from. And I'll throw in Know Your Terrorists, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri from episode 258 to understand again how Al-Qaeda um, was created, fostered, funded, um, actively colluded with by the U.S. military intelligence, uh, uh, NATO military and intelligence apparatus. So that's a lot to get through and, uh, you know, a lot to explore. But again, we are best served by knowing history. Um, let's move on to the next question. We have uh, Clarence writing in, My inquiry concerns the follow-up to terrorist attacks. Who benefits? The Terrorism Risk Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, signed into law by Bush in 2002 and recently renewed, and the like, appear benign on the surface, but insurance corporations would benefit if terrorism was not eliminated, and in fact was encouraged or perhaps funded via a backdoor. A protection racket from hell. Have you done work in this area? Well, you're in luck, Clarence. Yes, I have. Um, the most obvious thing that I would point you to is my documentary on the 9-11 money trail, 9-11 trillions, follow the money. Yes, talking exactly about this idea. I mean, insurance was one of the aspects of one of the many scams that were taking place on 9-11 and one of the ways that that was essentially a heist, ultimately of the trillions of dollars. But anyway, um, yes, clearly there are financial interests in these types of things, and it's not just reflected specifically in 9-11. Obviously, there's a bigger picture here. One that comes into view when you start taking a look at some of the other pieces of this puzzle. Let's look at a New York Times article from July of 2003, headlined, Pentagon prepares a futures market on terror attacks. It reads, quote, The Pentagon office that proposed spying electronically on Americans to monitor potential terrorists has a new experiment. It's an online futures trading market 
disclosed today by critics, in which anonymous speculators would bet on forecasting terrorist attacks, assassinations, and coups. Traders bullish on a biological attack on Israel or bearish on the chances of a North Korean missile strike would have the opportunity to bet on the likelihood of such events on a new internet site established by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The Pentagon called its latest idea a new way of predicting events and part of its search for the broadest possible set of new ways to prevent terrorist attacks. Two Democratic senators who reported the plan called it morally repugnant and grotesque. The senators said the program fell under the control of Admiral John M. Poindexter, President Ronald Reagan's national security advisor. End quote. And yes, just as a little bonus, who was... John M. Poindexter? Oh, that's right, one of the only people actually convicted in the Iran-Contra scandal, but don't worry, he was, that, that conviction was overturned on appeal, so I'm sure he was, uh, you know, clean as a whistle. And uh, yes, he went from that horrible disgrace right back into government, where he, of course, uh, headed up, as they say, the Information Awareness Office, that loving government program that in 2002-2003 unveiled their total information awareness uh, uh, plan where they had that wonderful logo of the uh, all-seeing eye in the capstone of the pyramid irradiating the planet um, and their plan at the time they said they wanted to snarf up every single piece of data that they could get on everyone including of course on American citizens in order to you know look for terrorists of course and there was a lot of outrage when this was revealed, so it just went underground, and as we know, the NSA basically um, continued to do it. So uh, that's John M. Poindexter, who was coming up with his futures trading market for terrorist attacks in uh, the bowels of DARPA. And I, as I understand it, the idea was not to have actual money betting, as far as I understand. It was, you know, it was like a, a fantasy stock market thing where people could bet. And I, as far as I understand, but who knows, maybe, and in real life, I mean, essentially, this is what really happens. If you do know about a terror attack, then you can, oh, say, double insure your building for, uh, you know, just to make sure, just, you know, uh, how much was the, uh, the New Jersey uh, uh, Port Authority uh, insuring the WTC towers for? Uh, let's, let's insure it for three, four, five times as much. You know, why not? And, oh, you know, let's make sure to write into the clause that if these buildings get completely destroyed through some horrible catastrophe that I can rebuild on them and capitalize on more retail space. Sound familiar? Yes. So this, I think, really does happen. There really are financial interests in terrorism. And as again, as we know, the terrorists are in government. So... If you know what's coming, you know how to profit from it. And never, ever, ever forget what CIA operative Robert Baer told We Are Change back in 2008. Well, last thing I would leave you with is National Reconnaissance Office was running a, a drill, a plane crash into their building. And you know their staff by DOD I and know CIA. The, right? I know the guy that went into his broker in San Diego and, and said, cash me out, it's going down tomorrow. Really? Yeah. That tells us something. Wow. What? That tells us something. Well, his brother worked in the White House. Remind me again why the same U.S. government that would capture and torture people like Abu Zubaydah and others on flimsy, if no evidence whatsoever, wouldn't do anything to even ask someone like Robert Baer, hey, who is that guy who cashed in the day before 9-11? I mean, it's just, that is so absolutely mind-blowing. Because either Robert Baer was flat out lying, which, hey, maybe he was, but that's a pretty bizarre lie to say. And the fact that, as far as I know, no one has ever asked him about this. No one has ever questioned this CIA operative who says he knew the guy who cashed out the day before 9-11. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? Apparently no one thinks so. All right, well, if, uh, hey, anyone in the audience, if you know Robert Bear or a way to get in touch with him, why don't you ask him about that? Maybe just find out if he knows, oh, the guy who knew about 9-11 the day before. That might be, that might be something people might want to know about. Utter, 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 utter insanity. Complete insanity. Um, it boggles my mind that, um, that Robert Bear isn't being interrogated right now. But anyway, all right. Okay, let's move on. Um, Alex writes, why are you not on Facebook? It is one of the biggest social media outlets. I'm a huge fan. Never heard somebody so informative in such a small amount of time. By show length. Um, why am I not on Facebook? And by the way, just 
once again, clarification, I'm not on Facebook. So if you think you are interacting with me on Facebook, um, newsflash, you're not. <laughs> I'm not on Facebook. So uh, I, I know there are fan pages or something, but it has nothing to do with me. Literally nothing. Um, why am I not on Facebook? Simply because uh, all of the things that we talk about with the, the, the Matrix-like T control grid and all of this information that's being st stored and data mined. Yeah, no, I don't want to join that. I don't want to willingly put myself or my family into that matrix. No, thank you. Now, having said that, here I am on YouTube. Here I am on Twitter. You know, I mean, I make use of these social media tools as tools because that's where the majority of people are. And I am doing this as an outreach to people, especially to people who, uh, would be the types of people who would just use these services without thinking about them. So, you know, I draw the line at Facebook. Why Facebook? You know, I also draw the line at Instagram and Snapchat, but that's only because I can't possibly fathom why I'd want to use them. But maybe that's a sign of an old fuddy-duddy. I don't know. I hope it is, <laughs> because that's that's fine by me. But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, I think a, a Everyone has to make the determination for themselves where that line is and what they're going to use and how they're going to use it and what kind of information they feed into that matrix if they do decide to dance with that devil. Because keep in mind, if you are not running the server, if you do not physically possess the content and everything that uh, that's going on, then it's not yours. And YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and all of these social media tools are someone else's platform and they can and they will take you down and silence you or censor you or do whatever they want uh, whenever they want to and um, just keep that in mind and purges have already happened and purges will continue to happen in the future uh, as i said before the revolution will not be youtube um, you might want to rewatch that um, that video so anyway that's why i'm not on facebook and never will be um, here I am on YouTube and elsewhere, so it's it's all a question of where you draw the line, and I'm just trying to reach people uh, in the matrix. Moving on, we have a question from Martin who writes, In the last couple months, we have been seeing a lot of news from Amok News Agency. Doing some research on what Amok News Agency really is, I find it hard to judge the credibility of this agency. I highly suspect this is just another propaganda source for the Western imperialistic agenda, which of course cannot be trusted. But... If this is actually someone from within the core of ISIS, I might be wrong, of course. Well, might be, but I have to question whether <laughs> propagandistic source of Western imperialistic agenda and core of ISIS are really separate entities. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. But anyway, you know, ICIASIS, I think we should always refer to it as. Um, yes, so for people who don't know, Amak News Agency is related to ISIS somehow. I don't think they officially claim to be ISIS news agency, but they have suspicious access to ISIS-related events like the fall of Palmyra, and um, they they reported the um, ISIS taking of responsibility for San Bernardino, you know, before anyone else. They were the ones who relayed that. So there's some sort of relationship there, um, supposedly. But here's, I mean, here's the interesting part of this for me most of the information that comes to the U.S. or the, the Western mainstream media about the what the Amok News Agency is reporting comes through Site Intelligence Group, run by Rita Katz. Are you familiar with Rita Katz? This, uh, I believe she was an Iraqi um, Jew uh, originally, but the son of an Israeli spy, surprise, surprise, a committed Zionist, surprise, surprise, who runs this site intel intelligence group that uh you know is looking for signs of terrorist activity online and reporting about it or, or they haven't served a subscription service so you're you know if you're a news outlet you can sign up and get the the updates and they'll they'll report things they'll report things before anyone else including um the steven sotloff beheading video the green screen beheading video <laughs> they site intelligence group reported it before ISIS. <laughs> they reported it and and apparently ISIS were going, how did you guys get this? How did how did you know this? So think of that what you will. They report the news before it happens, apparently. <laughs> so anyway, anything to do with Site Intelligence Group and anything they touch is highly suspicious, at the very least. So I would be very, very careful about anything that's coming through them, 
And since most of the mock news agencies um, information in English and in the Western press comes through site intelligence group. I mean, there has to be some questions raised. Um, but I don't know the specific details about a mock news. I don't have any inside sources or know any of the specific history of it. If anyone does, you know, share it. We'd be interested to hear. All right, let's move along to a, an audio question that was sent in by Ash. Hi, James. First off, I'd like to thank you for your tireless efforts and outstanding work on disseminating valuable information to the masses. I'm a big fan of your work and have followed you for many years. My question is regarding Brexit and the geopolitical repercussions of such a move. To outline, I agree on the fundamental principle that the current form of economic globalisation and centralisation of power is the wrong horse to back. The majority of the Leave campaign fueled their voters with pseudo-patriotism, Islamophobic and xenophobic hatred, and they rabble-roused and promoted downright factual lies that have been debunked almost as fast as they appeared, and promoted to demographics already entrenched in a very patriotic and nationalist belief system. And as you so rightly mentioned in your Brexit Wins video, nationalism is just a stepping stone to globalisation. Now that the exit goal has been tentatively achieved, and the hard-right nationalist views are becoming more pronounced across the UK and Europe due to migration and refugee issues, we have people like Nigel Farage of the UKIP party and Boris Johnson of the Conservative Party, big heads in the Leave campaign, subtly hinting about creating a new economic alliance with the Commonwealth, almost as if to make London and the UK the new Brussels, Belgium. I don't believe banking systems will change because of this exit. I don't believe the structure of the UK government will fundamentally change because of this exit. And the things the UK establishment is complicit in around the world won't change because of this exit. So my question is, does this exit matter at all? And is it really something to celebrate if it just spawns into the similar system of centralized power we've just voted out? All right. Thank you very much for the very articulate question, Ash. I appreciate it. And I think you articulated some of the, the big questions swirling around now in this post-Brexit era of quite well. Um, certainly, uh, if your question is, if nothing really changes in terms of the fundamental centralized systems of control or the, you know, the banking system or, you know, any of the fundamental systems, then does Brexit matter at all? And the answer is, of course it doesn't. Um, the question is, as I articulated in my interview with Jim Hogue, so I hope people will go and listen to that interview, I'll put the link in the show notes, that Brexit really, what this represents is still in flux, it's still to be determined, and it still ultimately depends on the consciousness of the people who are pushing for this phenomenon. And if that consciousness is stuck at the level of the mainstream debate, i.e., you know, you must rally around the Union Jack and, you know, God save the Queen, and, oh, you know, we, we've got to protect these City of London bankers, if that is where this conversation gets stuck, then yeah, I mean, I mean, instead of an EU flag ruling over people, it's a Union Jack flag and rule Britannia, Britannia rule the world. Who cares, right? I mean, it doesn't fundamentally undermine the system. It might make people feel a little bit better. It's not some, you know, European bureaucrats in Brussels ruling over them. Now it's, you know, good German folks like the British royal family. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. But obviously that doesn't fundamentally change anything. The real point of all of this is to educate those who do not understand about what the real paradigm is here, which is that collectivization, the globalization, which is part of subsuming your identity in a national collective or a European collective or a civilizational collective. Um, that is the that is the, the enemy. That is globalism. That is what they want. They want the collectivism, the collective identity, and people to collectively rally around a flag. And, the, you know, at the end of the day, doesn't matter what flag people rally around if they're still rallying around it. No. So it has to be about the consciousness of the people. And if people will not uh, abide with, by and participate in and allow the system to continue as it does, then it cannot function. It cannot function without our participation, our willing participation. And since people are trapped in the mindset of, well, of course, I mean, we need the government in Westminster. I mean, we need that government ruling over us. And of course, we need the queen at the top of it. I mean, uh, you know, it would be chaos and anarchy if we didn't have that, right? If that's the mindset people are stuck in, then the conversation itself becomes stuck. So, Decentralization, that's the only answer here. And, uh, and Brexit as a step towards that decentralization could be a good thing, but if it gets stuck at that stage, then it doesn't really accomplish the end goal, and uh, it's all for naught. So 
Again, I hope people will go and listen to that Jim Hogue uh, interview, um, where I think I articulated that fairly well. And so I guess on a, a similar note, since we're talking along these lines, um, I had a, a question in from Nick on um, my recent Hillary Clinton is a threat to all of humanity uh, video. He writes, James, are you a Trump supporter? I think Nick was being a bit tongue-in-cheek with this question, but fair enough, because I guarantee you every Joe Sixpack and Jane Soccer Mom that stumbles across the Corbett Report will see anytime there's a anti-Clinton video, oh, you must be pro-Trump, or anytime there's an anti-Trump video, you must be pro-Clinton. So let me be absolutely crystal clear, just in case anyone out there doesn't get it, I am not pro-Trump. Do not vote for Trump. That is not good. I am not pro-Clinton. Do not vote for Clinton. That is not good. Oh, I see. So you're a Stein kind of guy. No, do not vote for Jill Stein. Oh, Gary Johnson. No, do not vote for Gary Johnson. Oh, you're for some kind of fringe third party candidate, aren't you? Nope. I ain't for some fringe third party candidate or any candidate. I am a voluntarist. Yes, V for voluntarism. And uh, for those who are unfamiliar with this, it is an ethical position that the, uh, the initiation of violence against peaceful people is verboten, forbidden. And yes, uh, that is the definition of government, which claims to have a geographical monopoly over the initiation of violence against pe peaceful people. Most obviously, of course, in the collection of taxes, um, tributes to the ruler. Um, which, of course, are absolutely, I mean, unjustifiable at base, but everyone goes along with them because they've been indoctrinated it, uh, to it their whole life. Um, but, of course, always with the implied threat of violence, always at the implied barrel of the gun, it usually doesn't get that far because people usually don't resist that far, but sometimes it does, and sometimes people do, and some people try, and they don't get very far. So, that is fundamentally my position. I am against it's not just that I am against government. It is that I do not believe government to be an entity that exists in the way that people think it does. It is rather a mass delusion in uh, belief, delusionary belief, in the legitimacy of a ruling class. But that is not, that is not right, it is not valid, it is not proper, it is not ethical, and it is not true. It is a delusion. Um, what on earth am I babbling about? Uh, I've done many, 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 many hours of media talking about this in various forms. I'll throw in a couple of links to things that may be relevant um, for people who are interested, specifically episode 264 of my um, podcast on the government illusion. Uh, also, the last word on voting, which I think articulates my position on voting um, pretty well. So those are places to start if you don't know anything about this. And I think that ultimately this question of the binary thinking that, of course, most people are trapped in when it comes to these political Punch and Judy shows is a reflection of the immediacy and 24-7 online culture and the Twitter feed that never ends and, and that kind of constant flow of information that gets people not only stuck in the left-right paradigm or the, the binary paradigm, but also um, gets people to I think it, we really are be, becoming decontextualized or decontextualizing, <laughs> elizable. <laughs> our, our, our minds can't wrap around proper context, I think, in the way that they used to and to take an argument into its proper context. So that when you see a video that says, you know, don't for, for, for Clinton, you know, Clinton is bad, people will say, automatically believe that to be an endorsement of Trump. And... Uh, regardless of the the context in which it's offered, regardless of the history of of say this outlet, if you happen to know it, or you know what is to be expected in the future, it's always about the here and now. And this whatever ten minute video is everything, everything that this person wants to articulate in, in exactly the way that it has to be articulated. And and so they didn't say uh, don't vote for Trump. That means they want you to vote for Trump you know, idiocy like that. And um, at the end of the day, it's hard to win against people who can't or won't contextualize information. It is a phenomenon I've noted with disturbing, increasing frequency. Um, the more we get into the era of 
the 24-7 online news feed. And I, I noticed that myself last year when I wrote a series of international forecaster editorials. I had planned out a series of three editorials, so I wrote the first one, Why Hillary Clinton Must Not Be President. And of course, as expected, I got some emails from people who are saying, do you want a Republican to be president? Do you want Jeb Bush to be president? And because, of course, he looked like the presumptive nominee at that time. And uh, so, of course, on schedule, the next week, I released why Jeb Bush should not be president. And so then I got some emails from people saying, oh, oh, I see you're for Rand Paul, right? Or you think Rand Paul is going to be in a and the next week I released why no one should be president. It was always going to be that three-part series, but waiting for a three-part series to develop or, you know, waiting for the next part of the shoe to drop is just too much for some people to handle. So anyway, this section of the podcast is for the inevitable questions I will get. Anytime I do a anti-Clinton video, I'll get, are you endorsing Trump? Anytime I do an anti-Trump video, I'll get, are you endorsing Clinton? So this is for, to, you know, to answer that. So I'm going to use this as that answer. And it, you can direct people here for that answer if, uh, if you see it online as well. All right, let's move into the final part of the podcast, which is where I flip the mic around and ask you some questions that have come in. Um, for example, we had this interesting one from Sonia, who writes, I keep running into the same problem. I don't understand economics and banking well enough to follow what's going on. I've watched your documentary on the Federal Reserve, but I'm still missing lots of puzzle pieces. Please recommend books and videos that can help me to get up to, up to speed on this stuff. Thank you for the question, Sonia. It's a good question because, yes, the banking charade game parlor trick involves a lot of jargon and a lot of concepts that are intentionally difficult to understand. There is a lot of obscurantism um, rampant in these circles. So I understand it's intimidating for people who are dipping their toes in trying to figure this all out. And my Federal Reserve documentary is probably not the place for a complete beginner to these concepts and ideas. Um, I've tried to make it as simple to follow as a narrative as I could, but it's still a lot of information to take in. For someone who's really just dipping their toe into this, that's a good question. What's the best way to do that? Is there a good introduction to this? And I know there was this cartoon... Um, few years ago now. It was this half-hour cartoon. I can't even remember the name of it, but um, it was quite popular. And it was, it was kind of like a cartoon dumbed-down encapsulation of something like The Money Masters, which was the documentary that did it for me, you know, a decade ago. Um, <laughs> but it's a three-and-a-half-hour talking head documentary. That is not for beginners, I would say. So this, uh, this cartoon video was quite popular, but I didn't really like it. I thought it dumbed it down too much, and it relied on too many of those fake quotations that get bandied about. Oh, Andrew Jackson said blah, blah, blah. Thomas Jefferson said blah, blah. No, they didn't. Look it up. They didn't. Uh, it just gets endlessly repeated um, by people who are just copying whatever the last documentary said. So there's problems with a uh, resource like that. If anyone knows a really good beginner's guide to this stuff, let, let me know. Let everyone know. Let Sonia know. Um, we're all interested, I think. Um, in how to introduce this to people. Uh, the other question for you, uh, Tote My Note left a comment in the comment section of CorbettReport.com. A question about how privacy, how to protect privacy on the web. Does a VPN matter and what are the trade-offs? What browser do you use and does the choice matter? I have researched this info somewhat, but would like to hear what our virtual community has to say about it. And in the comment section there, uh, Corbett Report user MLK suggests a 2007 article from Crypt cryptagon.com.com that I have referenced a few times myself talking about, well, just assume that the NSA is your ISP and is actively trying to get all your information. How can you protect yourself against that? And that's probably a good assumption because, you know, for all intents and purposes, one way or another, the NSA is your ISP. So, you know, that's... Um, I'm not a I'm not a techie, so I don't have all the tech solutions. And hey, if somebody has some, you know, wonderful thing... Tor. <laughs> if you watch the latest New World next week, you'll know Tor is not the answer here. But um, if somebody else has some, you know, magic answer to all of this, please do provide it. But I tend to go with what John Young said on, on the Corbett Report several years ago now when I interviewed him. He said, online anonymity is a pipe dream. And I think that's probably, that's probably true, especially when we're talking about the concerted effort of an NSA or spying agency with their however many billions of dollars they have to bring to bear and the literal trunk lines, you know, in the back uh, room of the, the uh, telecoms, uh, literally, you know, in the trunk of the internet, 
if they really want to get some information, I'm going to guess that they're, they're going to have a way to do that. Um, uh, encryption is still a good idea, um, if only to protect yourself from everyday hackers and less sophisticated hackers. But again, I think if the NSA or whoever really wants in, they're probably going to find a way in. Maybe I'm just being pessimistic. Maybe someone out there has a real solution. I'd love to hear it. I'm sure everyone else would too. And I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, again, millions of questions. <laughs> it's too many questions. And I am just answering the ones that I think I can, you know, hit out of the park. Um, but please, if I didn't answer your question, please send it in again. And we'll do this all again next month. Uh, until then, or until the next time I talk to you, uh, thank you for tuning in. Take care. The Federal Reserve, the heart of the American banking system. For over 100 years, it has operated in the shadows, controlling America's money supply in total secrecy. So all that information is available uh, in our commercial paper. And program. who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks. Any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. Tell us who they are. No. Until now. 100 years ago, in 1913, the Fed was created. Fractional reserve banking. The legal authority to do it. Takeover of monetary policy. Are conducted by the Federal Reserve Banks. They are banks. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Century of Enslavement. The history of the Federal Reserve. Watch the documentary for free at corporatereport.com slash Federal Reserve and purchase a copy on DVD to help support The Corbett Report today.